My personal laptop kind of died, so Marine kindly volunteered hers. Thank you for that. So I want to talk about Cargo Cult Agile and specifically some of the problems that we have. Now, how often do you go to someone and you talk to them and they tell you that they're on this agile journey and they have this great new methodology and everything is changing and it's going to be great, but then it's not. And then maybe they find some other methodology and everything's changing again and this one's much better and this time it really is going to be great, but it's still not great. So why does that happen? Where do we go wrong? Well, I'm a developer. I've been the guy in the trenches fighting through it on many of these agile journeys. And I've spent a lot of time with other people who have also been there. And based on what I've learned in the process, I want to tell you where I think some of the problems are. So many people claim to do agile, but what does that really mean? So sure, we follow the ceremonies and we do what our methodologies say we should be doing, but do we know what we want to accomplish? Do we know what we're working towards? Do we use what's appropriate? Do we discard what's not? Are we measuring the right things? Now, I can't give you all of the answers, but hopefully I can help you to ask some of the right questions. But before you can get to the questions, I have to take you back almost 80 years to World War II. Now, if you've seen the movie Pearl Harbor, you'll know that the Allied forces were fighting Japan in the Pacific as well. So, the Allies built military bases on islands in the Pacific, and the inhabitants of these islands were not involved in the war, and they didn't really have much contact with the West, but they saw that these soldiers arrived, and they started building their bases and their airfields and their control towers and they had their radios, and because it was in the middle of the war, cargo planes would come and they would drop supplies for the troops on the ground. Now, obviously, the inhabitants of these islands saw that happening, but what they saw was the soldiers came and they had their runways and their radios and all of a sudden cool things started falling out of the sky. So this was great. But then the war ended and the soldiers left and the cargo stopped. Unless these islanders could do something to bring it back. So they did exactly what they saw the soldiers doing. They built airfields and they built control towers and they built radios but they built them out of bamboo and palm leaves and whatever else they had available in the hopes that it would bring back the cargo. But they were just following the ceremonies. They weren't looking at the values and they were hoping that that would bring back the cargo, but alas, no cool stuff fell out of the sky when they did that. And when we try to implement Agile, we fall victim to many of the same problems. It's, it's quite easy to get into that trap. Now, to me, Agile has always been about the principles and the values on the Agile Manifesto. It's about individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It's about working software over comprehensive documentation. It's about customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And it's about responding to change over following a plan. So it's about the what, not about the how. I was scrolling through Twitter recently and I saw someone complaining that on an Agile training course, a couple of days into the course, no one had even mentioned the Agile Manifesto yet. And that means we have a problem because we introduce people to Agile, but we sell it as a set of ceremonies and not a set of values. And then we go off and we repeat the ceremonies and we hope that we'll get the results. Now, if you enjoy the study of logic, this is actually a logical fallacy. In Latin, it's called post hoc ergo proptoc. After this, therefore, because of this. And it's when we make the assumption that if two things happen, the first thing caused the second thing. So we might look at a company and they're on this agile journey and they're doing really well. And what we see is they're having stand-ups. But we can't conclude that having stand-ups leads to successful projects. But a change in your values and a paradigm shift and collaboration, that's something that really helps. The team that I'm on at the moment doesn't really follow any defined methodology. We have a set of values. We know that we want to deliver good software, we want to collaborate. And what we do is a bit of Kanban, a bit of Scrum, a bit of XP, we do what works for us. And we regularly reflect and we adapt to make sure that we remain the best team that we can be. And to me, that's what Agile is about. Now, I wanna talk about some of the mistakes that I think we commonly make. One of them is how we run our stand-ups. So before we move on to this whole Agile journey, we tend to have these long project status meetings every day where we get everyone into a room and we sit them down for 30 minutes. One person opens up a spreadsheet and they do all the talking. 
Now, when we go the Agile route, we still do that, but because we're now Agile, we call that a stand-up. But it's not about collaboration, and no cool stuff falls from the sky when we do that. The next mistake that we make is we use misguided metrics. So things like story points become this crucial metric for how we measure our teams. But story points on their own are actually meaningless. They're very specific to a team, to how the team works, to the individuals on the team. Now, I remember chatting to a developer on a team once, and this team started out building a greenfield project, and eventually they moved it into production, and they started spending time on support. And I was chatting to someone on the team, and they told me that they were building a buffer into their task estimates to cater for support tasks. And I said, but that's not right. That's not how it works. By spending time on support, you're not adding more business value, so your velocity should be going down. It shouldn't be increasing. But the problem on that team was that their manager was pushing them for more and more story points in every iteration. And if you're pushing for more story points, you will get more story points. You won't necessarily get more business value. And by using a misguided metric, the team was hiding an issue that someone needed to look into. Someone had to go and see why they were spending so much time on support. But by using bad metrics, that just disappeared. Maybe this kind of thinking stems from traditional production and manufacturing. If you have a factory, getting as many items as possible off of your production line is a good thing. But software development doesn't work like that. You can't use the same kind of metrics. And remember, as the old saying goes, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. So let's not try and measure developer productivity by lines of code, and let's not try and measure agile effectiveness by the number of story points that we can get through. It's just a bad metric, and no cool stuff falls from the sky. The next thing, user stories. So we follow practices without understanding the value behind those practices. User stories are a good example. I once spent a little bit of time with the team, and as I was going through the area, I saw their task board. Now, user stories should help us understand the needs of our users and what our users want and what their world looks like. But this team had a lot of stories on the board that said things like, as system A, I want to integrate with system B. As system B, I want to integrate with system C. Now, no user wants that. Users don't want to integrate systems. Users want to process payments or get quotes or do something that has value in a business context. And if user stories just become a template, we lose the value. We don't understand what our users want. And no cool stuff falls from the sky. The next one, retrospectives. Now, I personally believe that retrospectives are some of the most valuable meetings that a team can have, because that's where continuous improvement happens. That's where we go to reflect on what we do and improve and to become a better team. But retrospectives need action items to come out of them, like smart goals. You need someone to take ownership of it and drive those positive changes. But if we just have retrospectives so that we can tick them off in a little agile checklist and go, hey, look, we're agile, we lose out on the value. And we have meetings where people sit and get frustrated because it feels like it's time that would be better spent on doing actual real work. And again, when we do that, no cool stuff falls from the sky. The next thing that we tend to do is we are control freaks. So we call ourselves Agile and we try to do these Agile methodologies, but everything that we do still looks a lot like waterfall. We try to fix time, we try to fix scope, we try to decide how long things will take, and maybe it's because that feels safe, it's because it, it feels like we get some measure of control, but again, software development doesn't work like that. No matter how well we try and estimate when things will be done, Plans like that just don't work in software. And again, when we do that, no cool things fall out of the sky. In fact, if a manager goes to a team and says what should be done and when it should be done, that's not agile. That's just overtime. And getting back to something I wanted to mention about retrospectives as well, when we chase metrics, one of the ones that I've seen used in the past as well is... A manager once told me that he thinks that bigger teams should have more smart goals coming out of their retrospectives. Now, if your metric for success is smart goals per person, sure, that looks good, but it's, it's not a good metric. And it's actually nonsense in practice because small things move quickly. 
large things move slowly. So you can't go and introduce a multitude of big changes into a large team and expect everything to get the attention that it deserves. So, like I said, bad metrics. Don't go with bad metrics. You drive bad behavior. So, in conclusion, what I would like to leave you with is never stop questioning why you do what you do. And see what works for you. Stick with what works and ruthlessly discard what doesn't work for you. Ask the right questions. Is this working for us? Are we putting principles above values? And don't do it by the book if the book doesn't allow you to become the best team that you can be. Thank you.